Blessings, everyone. We're here this afternoon to honor Phil, our dear brother, friend, husband, co-worker, son, father, one-of-a-kind man that always kept us smiling whenever we were in his presence. We're sad and we miss him today deeply, but we also remember today Phil's distinctiveness. I mean, that's why we're all here, friends. We have one thing in common for sure, and that's that we knew this beautiful man. His casual brilliance, his kind heart, his smiling eyes. To have met Phil means that you had to have experienced his warmth. I was his pastor, and I can tell you that he warmed everyone he touched. His dry wit, his compassion, his humor. So let us this day first remember together how wonderful and how seen he made you feel. How honored and safe he made you feel. Secondly, let's remember we're here sadly to say goodbye on many levels. Although we know we'll see him again those that believe. And thirdly, I, I think it's important that we also take a look at our own lives today and ask the question that I know Phil asked, am I ready? Are we ready to meet our maker? And I know personally, without a doubt, I'll get to see my brother Phil again and enjoy the boundless love of our Lord. And I understand that when it comes right down to it, these words today are for us more than for him. He's on the other side. Phil has already graduated into eternity with all of its joys. We're left here with tears. And so with a few minutes, moments actually, that I have left, I just wanna to turn to the words that Phil himself gave openly. That's right. I want to turn to the words that Phil gave openly himself when he shared his faith with us from the pulpit at our church. I thought, you don't know me, but you sure knew him. So let's have Phil's words fill this room. Speaking of his childhood, first Phil said, I did not grow up in a family of faith. He spoke of his grade school years and he said, prejudice against religion was his scene for the next 25 years. In fact, Phil said he was quick to say that his critical, skeptical attitude was probably the reason he went into science in the first place. And yet, Phil described that when he was an adult, paradoxically, he said to me and from our platform, it was precisely my criticism and skepticism that brought me to God. As Phil said, he began reading books on the history of the New Testament from Bart Ehrman. And although he says um, that Ehrman's voice was, was to help him parse out the ancient controversies, Phil explained what really seized him, friends, wasn't the history or the critique, but actually that for the very first time in his whole life, he actually began to read devotionally. He said he had always read, as you guys know, scientific treaties. And he said the fiction that my professors, my English professors mandated. But I had never read anything just for my heart, devotionally, he said. And after over 35 years, he said he began to read from that state of mind. And that's when he opened the scriptures. Phil's words were that he was immediately overwhelmed with the beauty of the gospel of the faith he had in Jesus Christ. He was amazed that this truth had escaped him for three decades. He went on to say, many things come from a deeper place of knowing than we can pencil out on a napkin, he said. For instance, he said how he knew how he loved his wife, Jamie. Phil said, quote, the very first moment I saw her, and I didn't even need to do any calculations to figure that out. <laughs> he went on to say that as he read throughout the Bible, he found the scriptures 
truly resonated with him, specifically this one he read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Phil explains that, explained later that no one can achieve complete knowledge through reason alone. Dear friends, as a respected scientist and a faithful believer in Christ, Phil knew what many scholars have discovered, and namely, that is, that there is no conflict between faith and science. Witnessed by his words, Phil said, science is a tool of limited remit, a limited tool, he said. It is not a belief system, he said, and therefore science cannot replace belief as a system. Love, it turns out, Phil said, is even more difficult to manipulate mathematically than temperature. <laughs> and he emphasized these thoughts with excerpts from 1 Corinthians, which I know Reverend Kara will read shortly. Phil confessed, I pursued partial understanding for most of my life, and I found it unsatisfying. He said, as I climbed up the scientific ladder, I found nothing there except for limits. Then quoting verse 11, he said, when I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. In closing, Phil said, so I am nearly 44 years old, and today I take lessons from my six-year-old boy in the simple joy of experiencing the world as if I had new eyes. That's what he said about you. <laughs> and then he finished by saying, but it will not be until the day I lay down my last glass for the last time that I will fully know what this world was that I left behind. And then before Phil walked off the platform, he said, verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That, he said, I know is true. Let us pray as we continue to remember our brother Phil, who smiles down upon us in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all these people that are gathered and united in this united church. We thank you for the light that Phil was and still is to our lives. We pray for the blessing and the abundance of their, the, the, his family as they move on and the support of this precious community that cares for him, Jamie, and these kids so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. Dr. Philip William Leonard, Phil to his friends, was born to Carol Franda and John Leonard in McLean, Virginia. After graduating from McLean High School, Phil attended the University of Chicago, where he pursued his bachelor's degree and took graduate chemi chemistry classes concurrently and researching chemical synthesis in the Wolf and Eaton laboratories. He graduated magna cum laude, with both his bachelor's and master's in chemistry in 2001. His graduate studies continued at UC Berkeley, where he was a joint graduate student in the Arnold and Volhart laboratories, where he taught organic chemistry and synthesized numerous compounds, including hexaferrocenobenzene, the most sterically crowded benzene ever discovered. In 2007, Phil received his PhD in organic and organometallic chemistry and became a postdoc researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Dr. Phil Pagoria's group, where he began his career in energetic materials, synthesizing several high nitrogen heterocycles. Phil took a second postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab in 2009 in Dr. David Chavez's group synthesizing more high nitrogen energetics, and transitioned to a full-time scientist at LANL 
in 2011, where he produced environmentally friendly energetics, reconstituted on-site pilot capabilities, and grew into a role as program manager for energetic R&D, a position that benefited greatly from a manager with Phil's scientific and energetic materials experience. Unquestionably, Phil was academically and professionally accomplished. However, Phil's earned degrees and awards lay at the bottom of the file cabinet in the family home. The walls of Phil's home office were adorned with photos of his family, friends, his, uh, his famed, na famed National Rifle Association Lifetime Member Certificate, <laughs> and numerous perfect score target shot from long range. In Phil's closet, next to his suits, khakis, and button-up, mostly yellow shirts, we think. <laughs> uh, hung his International Practical Shooting Confederation shirts from the myriad of competitive shooting tournaments that he excelled in. Among the personal items returned to Phil's family from his office at Lanel were his son's toys, reminders of his mother's upcoming medical appointments, photos of his wife and son, and the coffee cup from which he imbibed a caffeinated acuity to face life's daily challenges. In the day-to-day, -day, academic and professional accolades were a small, unnoticeable, unnoticeable part of who Phil was. Phil was a brilliant, well, he was brilliant, a talented scientist, a skilled teacher, and had an innate curiosity for the world around him. These objective truths about Phil, however, cannot convey the leadership he provided and the guiding beacon he was to his co-workers, friends, and family. Phil approached life with a sense of humor, laughing at himself, and never letting adversity overcome him. Anyone who even briefly acquainted themselves with Phil immediately knew this man was genuine and empathetic. He loved teaching and taught officially at UC Berkeley, UNMLA, and Lanel, and unofficially to his co-workers and friends on the diverse areas of which he was battle-hardened. To his friends and family, Phil was the single most honorable, honest, generous, and trustworthy man anyone could ask for. Phil was generous with his time, always lending a patient, attentive ear to anyone who, bede who was bedeviled by the pains of life. He always made time to visit his friends and family, and al would always be there if beckoned on a moment's notice. Words cannot describe the immeasurable void that remains in the wake of his untimely loss. In September of 2021, Phil and Jamie Keehan were married. And in July of 2022, Phil began his new beloved role as father when he and Jamie welcomed their son, Killian, to the world. Phil was deeply devoted to his family as a caring husband and father and cherished his time with them. Their daughter, Hailey, is due in June of 2024. Phil is survived by his wife, Jamie, son, Killian, soon-to-be-born daughter, Hailey, mother, Carol, brothers, Charles and Robert, Aunt Virginia, and his dogs, Skylar and Duma. being here for Phil. I want to welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit.
We thank you for the love in this room. We thank you for the dream that Phil was in your heart that's touched all our lives. We thank you for the dream that continues on in his beautiful wife, family, and all these friends gathered. Thank you for all that have gathered here, Lord, for Kara who helped organize all of this. And we open our hearts to the reading of your word now as we move into the rest of this service. Bless you in Jesus' name. Our reading today comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It is often used in weddings, but it is a message to an entire body of people, a whole community, not just two individuals. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my body to feel good about what I have done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. Love isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Dr. Philip William Leonard was my best friend for 21 years. I had the good fortune to see Phil almost every day for over 16 of those years. I first met him in graduate school at Berkeley in 2003 and then continued to work with him at Livermore and then Los Alamos as we seemed to follow one another in our careers. Now I can stand up here and tell you that he was born March 19, 1979, that he went to University of Chicago and UC Berkeley. But these are facts you can read about him in his obituary. I can also stand up here and give you generic platitudes like, he will be missed, he was a great man, and he thought Nickelback was a terrible band. <laughs> While these are all true, they could be said about anyone. And these details are... <laughs> and these details are too boring, too beige. No, I am here to tell you about the Phil that I knew that I had the incredible privilege and honor of knowing so well and to share with you the amazing person that he was. When Phil was very small, he would go to work with his mom, Carol, who ran her own business. One of her employees used to drive a Firebird to work every day, and every day when she'd come in, she'd rev the engine and walk in and ask Phil, do you like the Firebird? Mm -hmm. Phil loved the sound of the engine and would wait at the window every day in anticipation. One day, she pulled up as usual, and even though he's only a few months old, Phil said his first word, Firebird. <laughs> the Firebird would turn out to be a lifelong allegory for Phil, one that fit him very well. The Pontiac Firebird, of course, takes its name from the Phoenix, the legendary bird of Greek and Egyptian myth that rises up out of the ashes of its predecessor in a cyclical life. It's fitting that Phil had an affinity for this creature as he was one of the most resilient people that I ever knew. Each time, the adversities in life would knock him down, he would rise up again, never letting anything hold him back or throw him into despair. When he was four, his parents divorced, a difficult life event for a child, yet Phil rose to the challenge and continued on. Phil grew up in Virginia in the Washington, D.C. area near his father while living with his mother, Carol, who never remarried, and he learned a great deal about resilience and carrying on through her example as a single mom. He also gained a love of history there, 
visiting the Smithsonian, Civil War sites, and other historical monuments in the area. I have no doubt that Phil learned about struggle and triumph from history, and I think he would find it quite fitting that his service is here today in the original Manhattan Project Chapel. Phil's ability to rise up from the ashes allowed him to jump into anything with both feet, not hold back, and give his heart to whatever he did. In contrast, I am very cautious by nature, and I always admired how Phil could dive headfirst into anything, unafraid of failure or being hurt. I think that he knew that even if he did fail or he was hurt, he would still come out all right on the other side and learn from the attempt. Because of this, he was able to enter new experiences unafraid, and he never messed out on any of the opportunities that life presented. These new experiences also extended to the mundane, such as car repair. When we were in graduate school in California, it goes without saying we had no money. So we were forced to save wherever we could, which included working on our own cars. One evening, Phil called me and told me that his car had a leaking heater core. I told him to come over the next morning so we could work on it, and he arrived about mid-morning on a Saturday. At the time, he was, appropriately, driving a maroon 1988 Firebird GTA, a car his mother bought in the late 1980s and transferred to him when he was old enough to drive. When he arrived at my apartment, he popped the hood. I had a roll of painter's tape and some markers ready to label all the wires and hoses that we were going to disconnect so we could get them back to the right places. But not Phil. He popped the hood and dove in head first, unafraid of the consequences, and started tearing wires and hoses off willy-nilly. <laughs> Admittedly, I was a little scared that the car would never run again and have to be towed from out in front of my apartment. But Phil seemed unfazed, and after several hours of work, we found ourselves staring at a hose clamp that needed to be removed. This clamp was tucked deftly into the narrowest space possible and was nearly inaccessible. It was rather obvious that the designer of this car had wanted someone to remove the entire front clip and fender from the car to get to the heater core, something that Phil and I had no intention of doing. In our stubbornness, we decided that the best way to remove this hose clamp was to cut it off with a hacksaw. Unfortunately, the full hacksaw would not fit down into the crevice, so we removed the blade. By sticking the bare blade down into the crevice and holding onto it with two fingers, we were just able to move it back and forth about a millimeter at a time. So Phil and I took, slowly took turns sawing away at this, never stopping for a break for the next two hours. And by this point, it was around seven o'clock at night. And when the hose clamp finally broke, Phil looks up at me with a huge grin and goes, well, that was easy. <laughs> this became our mantra throughout the rest of the time that I knew Phil. Whenever we had an awful task that was incredibly difficult to complete, when we finished, we would turn to another and announce loudly, well, that was easy. <laughs> Phil's indomitable spirit also allowed him to provide support to his loved ones when they went through difficult times. When my mom died of cancer in 2010, Phil was the first person that I called. He talked with me on the phone for over an hour, listening, concerned, and supportive. A short while after we hung up, he called back. He asked if I could pick him up at the airport the next day. He had taken vacation from his postdoc at Lanel and bought plane tickets to St. Louis to be with my family, completely unasked. While the rest of the world swirled around us in the chaos of funeral preparations, we sat in my room and talked, Phil helping bring some order and calm to my life and helping me realize that I too could rise up again from the ashes and continue on. No one could ask for a better friend. This extension of his spirit also applied to cars, as he owned a 1968 Firebird he was in the middle of resurrecting, which is probably the most on-the-nose reference to the life existence of the Phoenix one could possibly imagine. And again and again, Phil would be kicked in the teeth by life, and over and over, he would climb from the nadir and gain his feet under him again. Many of you may not know that his first marriage was after undergrad, about a week before he started in Berkeley in 2001. This ended in a divorce when he was in graduate school and was very hard on him. Not long after his divorce, his beloved cat Alfbau died, and then barely a year later, his 88 Firebird was hit by a careless student totaled by the insurance company. All of these losses were compounded by the stress and overwork of graduate school, and one evening, just for a few minutes, that immense strain finally got to Phil. It was the only time I have ever seen Phil come close to despair, and it remains the only time I've ever seen him cry. I remember at the time being amazed that anyone could continue on and not wind up depressed and miserable with the massive knockout punches he had been dealt. And yet, despite what he felt were the smoldering ruins of what his life had been, he would not be kept down. He looked forward and started anew, persevering and succeeding at his studies and in his life. 
Of course, not all the changes in Phil's life were bad. When he took his postdoc in Los Alamos in 2009, I helped him move from Livermore to Los Alamos. Although, for those of you who are here from Livermore today, you may consider this a bad change. <laughs> at the time, Phil was renting a room from a, uh, in a house at Livermore. And on moving day, I and a couple of my friends showed up to find a large U-Haul with a car trailer out front. It was around 9 a.m., and seeing it looked like everything was in order, I figured we'd probably be on the road around 11 or maybe noon and head out. Instead, Phil comes out carrying two empty banker's boxes and says, let's get packing. <laughs> we looked around at each, as we went in the house and realized absolutely nothing had been packed yet. <laughs> so around noon, when I thought maybe it would be the latest time we'd be on the road, we're still furiously throwing anything we could into random boxes and tossing it all into the truck as fast as possible. Finally, around 4 p.m., sweaty and exhausted, we finally loaded the truck. I looked at Phil and said, okay, we're, we're really late today. Let's, let's take a night and start early in the morning. And Phil looks at me and says, hey, I already got the hotel book. Let's go, and hops in the truck. Shook my head for a minute and then followed him. We headed out from Livermore and turned south on I-5. And I asked Phil, I said, hey, where, where are we stopping tonight, Bakersfield? Without any hesitation or even looking up from the road, Phil says, Needles, Arizona. <laughs> and I, of course, I realized just how long a drive this was going to be, done mostly in the dark. <laughs> After a long day of packing and loading, nonetheless, we settled in for the drive and kept going, switching drivers, stopping for snacks, and generally trying to keep ourselves awake. Finally, around 2 a.m., we crossed the border into Arizona. We found our hotel, we checked in, dropped all our suitcases on the bed, completely exhausted. Phil turned to me with a giant smile and said, well, that was easy. <laughs> One of Phil's less auspicious moves was to a balcony. Some of you may have known that Phil actually lived homeless on the balcony in the lab of our chemistry building for a few months in grad school. While this may seem unbelievable, it was not actually all that uncommon in Berkeley, where the rent was insanely high, the pay was insanely low, and the university had an awful financial system that neglected to pay at the graduate students, sometimes for months at a time. I myself had discrepancies in pay, although I was one of the lucky ones, and really only had a few weeks of problems here or there at a time. Two of my other friends lost two and three months of consecutive pay, respectively, but Phil had the longest that I knew of, almost five months of no pay. Without any way to pay rent, Phil did what numerous other graduate students, postdocs, and visiting scholars had done. He camped out in the chemistry building. Most of the other students had chosen lounges, group offices, or simply the desk in their lab, but Phil had a longer stint than most, and he put up a Cabela's hunting cot out on the balcony. <laughs> Rather than give up, Phil rose up again from the adversity that life had heaped on him. In his typical optimistic style, Phil later recalled, the HVAC left something to be desired, but the commute was great. <laughs> the university eventually straightened out his pay and Phil moved back into an apartment. This, in and of itself, is an incredible story of overcoming adversity. However, the epilogue is amusing, as of course, working at Livermore in Los Alamos requires a clearance. As most of this audience is well aware, one of the areas that OPM checks is your list of residences. I was already working at Livermore at the time with a clearance when Phil came in as a postdoc, and OPM interviewed me for his clearance. It was an interesting interview, and it went a little something like, so his address is listed as 633 Latimer Hall, but when we looked that up, that's a chemistry building, not a dorm. Is that a mistake? I said, no, that's correct. OPM says he, he, he lived in the lab? I said, well, technically he lived on the balcony, but it was accessed through the lab, so yeah. The officer was completely incredulous and, of course, had to ask someone else about Phil's residency, so they went to our professor, Peter Volhart. They asked him if Phil was living on the balcony. He said, yes. <laughs> they said, well, isn't this against university policy? And to which Peter shrugged and replied, it's been done before, therefore not punishable. <laughs> and, of course, having not lied about his residence, Phil was granted his clearance. And he continued his ascent into the world of energetic materials that led him here to Los Alamos and to all of us. This story and thousands of others that we each have are a testament to Phil's spirit, his character, and his good nature. Most recently, I got to see a side of Phil that I had never seen before, as a father. He loved being a dad and would send me pictures of Killian and we would talk about the joys and challenges of being a father. Having weathered many difficult times, this was a wonderful change in Phil's life that he met with joy. In a text January 28th of this year, Phil told me, my interpretation of being a good father means spending time with Killian. Unfortunately, that means I'm bad at basically everything else. 
There is no getting around it. Phil's loss is tremendous and tragic. Each of us wishes that we could continue to create new stories with Phil. The only small consolation is that I know Phil, like the Firebird, rises again in Killian and Eiley. And a part of him lives on in each of us, his friends and family. I challenge each of us to live as Phil did, without worry of defeat, knowing that we can always rise up from the ashes and begin anew. I ask that we all cherish and share our memories of Phil with Killian and Eiley as they grow up so they can know their father through our stories and our memories. At this difficult time when we must say goodbye to the man that we knew so well, shared so many laughs and good times with, our coworker, our teacher, our friend, our brother, our husband, I would say this to Phil. Phil, my best friend, my brother, I know that you are with all of us right now and that you of all people would understand when I say, well, that was easy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie. I was Phil's younger brother. And uh, I'm going to have to apologize. I might have to go a little bit slow on this one. All right. But I first want to thank everyone for being here. I, for those of you who were at the roast yesterday, I just seeing the people that my brother touched and impacted means so much to me. It makes me so proud to be his little brother. And I really appreciate you guys being here. And his legend lives on in all of us. And I really appreciate you for carrying my brother's legacy with you as you go forward into your lives. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And now I'm probably going to be looking down at my speech the whole time, so I do apologize. <laughs> my name is Charlie. I had the honor and privilege to be Phil's little brother. During my short time on this planet, I have had plenty of leaders. I have met strong men, and I've had loyal friends. None of them compared to Phil. As my older brother, Phil was my best leader. He led by example, and he always had the door open to me. He would always take care of those he cared about, even to his detriment. He showed me how to always do the right thing and to take care of each other, even when the other party doesn't deserve it. Phil looked at me as the strong one, but his endurance, resilience, and resolve are unparalleled. I've watched him do back-breaking work and drive through the night just to help as much as he could for myself, for his friends, and for his family. I will always remember his uncanny ability to control an emergency situation. He had the unique ability to take correct, decisive action. Several times I can think back on family trips and adventures where he was able to assess the situation and fix it somehow. Looking back, I do not feel as though I deserve to have had such an amazing older brother. And I did not appreciate him enough. I hope I can inspire someone in this room today to take the time to tell your friends and family how much you love and admire them. One of my favorite stories I have of Phil is when we were learning how to paramotor. Whatever crazy adventure I had in mind, he was always supportive. From our first successful tr hunting trip to indoor skydiving, long range shooting, and even our paramotoring course, Phil time found the time to be there and to join in on the fun. For two weeks, Phil dropped everything to go with me to Luling, Texas to learn how to paramotor. It was pretty brutal running around in the Texas heat in July with huge parachutes. <laughs> On Phil's maiden voyage into the sky, he couldn't get into his seat properly. <laughs> and he ended up doing the world's most intense ab exercise, holding his legs and torso into the harness. <laughs> By the time he made it to the ground, he was so exhausted he fell right over. 
We all thought he got hurt somehow and started rushing over. Turns out he was just giving the earth one big giant hug. <laughs> Thankfully he was all right and we all had a good laugh over it. Later I asked the instructor, who has the most interesting and funniest landings? And he said, without a doubt, Phil. <laughs> that being said, Phil was resilient and determined and he didn't quit. Even after that first flight, he completed two additional flights and was one of the few students that actually got to fly during the two-week course. I really wish I could fly with him again, but more than anything, I wish he was on the ground with us. One day I will fly with you again, Phil, but until then, I'm going to do the best I can to be a better, stronger, and more empathetic man like you taught me and showed me how to do. Thanks for being the best older brother that I could ever ask for. I love you, Phil. I am uh, Robert Leonard, I go by Bobby, I'm Phil's other brother. I am the youngest and by far the most spoiled. In an effort to keep this as light as I possibly can, I'm going to open with a very silly question. I'm sure you've heard it before, but probably not in a situation like this. But what would you do in a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Someone knows where I'm going with this. I would be completely useless. I found that out pretty quickly when Phil took me and Charlie to a long-range precision rifle course. I was not expecting what I got when I arrived. It was like the wild, wild west. Everyone was walking around with a gun on their hip. But what really surprised me is the place we all introduced ourselves. It was this nice, elegant boardroom long conference table, fancy leather office seats, and a former, uh, former army sniper teaching the course. Now everyone had been looking forward to this for a very long time, and they were very straight-laced, responsible gunmen. When it came time to introduce ourselves, you're supposed to say your name and your gun, kind of like your name and major, but way cooler. <laughs> now I was first, and I was right next to the sniper, and he's like, okay, sir, what gun do you have? Your name, and I was like, well, I'm Bobby, I do know that, but I have no idea what gun I'm using. <laughs> and the looks on everyone's faces were like, what is this guy doing here? Who let this guy in here? And I look at Phil, what gun do I have? And um, now I'm gonna be honest, it may not have been the best gun there, but it definitely was the worst. <laughs> but beggars can't be choosers and I couldn't care less. Phil did everything. He brought the guns, he brought the ammo, he cleaned them afterwards. All I had to do was the fun part, the point and shoot part. But at 1,200 yards, there was a bit of a process to it. And you had to have a spotter and measure wind and all that. But when you're ready to shoot, you and your spotter have to go through a confirmation process. Spotter ready, shooter ready, send it. Now everyone else did that the whole time, but we immediately got bored. We, it's, we started coming up with all, all sorts of different things to say. They were mostly pretty goofy, like roll the dough, put it in the oven, deliver the pizza, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but they got pretty out of hand pretty quickly. Uh, most of them I'm not going to repeat in such a respectful establishment like this. <laughs> we may not have been the best shot, but we definitely had the most fun. We were also the only group to come up with a name. And we were very, actually very proud of this. <laughs> the projectiles. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've done a lot of cool things together. We kayaked and canoed over 50 miles, bringing all of our gear and food with us. 
We traveled a lot. We went to a lot of national parks. We even went to Jamaica. But the rifle course was definitely my favorite. All of us were in like just a really giddy mood, and that just makes it so much better. And Phil was hilarious. He had a very unique, slightly wicked sense of humor, <laughs> but I loved it, and he cracked me up a lot. And he was very generous with his laughter. Um, that's, not, that's not always true with funny people, because they want to be the funniest in the room. But Phil had so much going for him that it didn't really matter, and he just wanted everyone to have a good time. But that moment of, what gun do I have, Phil? That's, that moment is like what he was to me. A very protective, comforting, and selfless presence. He could, he could be a little rough around the edges, but he was good to his people. Very good to his people. Now everyone knew he was brilliant, and he was. I've met people that spoke seven languages, people that had perfect SAT scores, but he was the most brilliant person I've ever met. I was and am very proud of him. I respected him a lot. And I just wish that I talked to him the way I talked about him. But to me, he was a lot more than intelligent and impressive. He was a great older brother, to the point that he was pretty much a father to me and Charlie. In conversation, he would always stand up for me. He would defend me. He would compliment me. And if things seemed off, he would check in on me afterwards. He always kept his priorities straight. Uh, so many people get caught up in a lot of very surface level bull crap, but he didn't. He thought deeply about things that actually matter. And he didn't take things that don't matter so seriously. I mean, we saw how he dressed, right? <laughs> But most people have those in reverse. But family, family mattered to him. All right, I'll end with one more quick story. I used to say all the time that I think it would be good for me to hunt. Not necessarily because I wanted to, but because I eat meat every day without knowing, or experiencing rather, uh, what has to happen in order for me to be able to do that. We live in a very advanced society where you can become blissfully ignorant to what it means to be human, you know? I used to say this all the time. I used to talk a lot of crap about a lot of things, but never actually took any concrete step towards actually doing it. And uh, Phil made a connection with a guy that owned a huge hunting property in Texas. Once again, he planned it. He got the ammo, got the guns. I flew out to New Mexico. We drove to Texas together and met Charlie there. We realized very early on we could not be in the same blind. We were laughing so much the blind was rattling. <laughs> I think the squirrels and the birds left. We didn't see anything. So we decided we had to split up. And uh, between the two blinds, just start rotating brothers, you know? Now I was with Charlie in the first one, and it was the most, it was a very horrific experience when he shot the deer. <laughs> And I decided right then and there, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> and so when I got the blind to myself, I just put the gun down, got my phone out, put headphones in, started listening to music, and just scrolling on my phone. I ain't doing this. But I look up, and I saw a buck. And it was the only buck we saw on the whole trip. And Charlie's voice crept in the back of my head telling me to do it. So I did, and I got what I asked for. It was a very impactful experience. And um, it... Yeah, it was, it was good for me, to be honest, but it was more impactful than I thought it would be. But the whole point I bring it up is that I forgot I asked for it. I, I, it's something you say so much you forget you say it. And I thought it was just our bros trip this year that they were dragging me along on. And uh, Phil, he never brought up that he was doing it for me. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think it took much convincing. <laughs> 
But he'd, he'd, had, he'd heard enough of me talking about it, never really doing anything, so he's like, all right, I'll just do it for you like everything else. Set everything up, never said anything, never held it over my head, nothing. So I just didn't even know. Now me, I gave Charlie a bite of my sandwich back in 08 and I still remind him. <laughs> Remember that time I was really good to you? <laughs> Phil was an absolutely brilliant man. He was curious about learning in the world, which is just so rare, and I respect that a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you here are like that as well. He was as real as it gets. He did what he wanted to do and what he felt like was right. He was a super loving and caring brother in his own way. And to me, he was a very protective and loyal source of strength and wisdom. So what would I do in a zombie apocalypse? My plan was always very simple. I'd call Phil and do whatever he told me. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, that was during the hunting trip on the back of your pamphlet. <laughs> we went to a ranch and got him to do that. Hello everyone, my name is Howard, and I want to tell you about my friend Phil. Um, in the last month or so, I think I thought about a million words to say about him, but he was more than a friend to me. He was my brother in Christ, and it was one of the most special friendships I've ever had in the short time I, I've known him. <clears throat> As my fellow church members know, um, I cry a lot, so, <laughs> and I also don't see so well, so I'm up and down here. But this friendship was a friendship minted as a gift from God and forged in the fire of our walk together as Christians. Not a day has gone by I've not thought about my dear friend, his pleasant smile, his warm laugh, dry and amazing sense of humor, and genuine ability to just be a light to those around him. I had a lot of thoughts swirling in my head for quite a while, and one I kept asking myself a question, when did I meet Phil? And I honestly couldn't come up with the answer because I felt like I had known him forever. I'm pretty sure Pastor introduced us at one of our men's breakfasts one day, but for all I could do, I could not remember. He just seemed like he'd been a friend of mine forever. It's strange how things like that transcend time and our ability to comprehend. And it's just been so nice to just hear about everyone talk about Phil. And everyone knows about his incredible intellect, but he was also a man of incredible faith in the Lord. He found faith in Jesus and took that leap of faith. He got baptized in the Pecos River one day And I was there to experience it with, it, him, with, it, with him, as so were many others. I'll never forget that day and also the joy I saw in Phil's face. That joy took on a whole new glory as I witnessed. And the angels rejoiced that day. Phil and I had many great discussions about science, international relations, just about everything. But including probing questions about faith and scripture. We started carpooling not, uh, together not too long ago and spent quite a bit of time writing and kibitzing about so much. One time he asked me, what is this men's group all about? That question kind of stopped me in my tracks because I thought, wow, man, I thought I better have a super cerebral intelligent answer or else. <laughs> but, but Phil didn't really respond in that kind of way. I'm glad the Holy Spirit gave me the one word answer needed in that moment in that car at that moment. And Phil just looked at me and seemed satisfied about that answer. I went, okay, good. Uh, then at work, we would occasionally ponder something about why we do what we do. Just one of those times uh, we were debating something the lab director had said, 
and I sent Phil an email about it asking my learned colleague what he thought, and I thought I'd just share it with you. The first line of his response went like this. It occurs to me that empires go through a life cycle similar to human beings, birth, expansion, decline, senescence, and none of the previous empires in the world could forever for foresee their demise even when in decline. And it went on, it went on with his usual cutting and profound analysis that was just so enjoyable. I told Phil one time at church, I said, I hope you're writing down all these thoughts and ideas in a book. And then I said, I don't normally read books like that, but I want to read yours. <laughs> I think he said he was working on something, and I'm hoping there is a manuscript, maybe somewhere in a box, somewhere maybe. Oh. I guess one of the things I'm most sorrowful about is I won't get the chance to discuss and debate things now with him. I actually heard a sermon about that this morning. It was really powerful. Uh, we had been talking about retirement. I know he had a few years more to go than maybe I did. Uh, and at some point, maybe moving to Texas or something like that. And I thought I would have this friend for a really long time, and we'd meet up, and we'd be these old guys in a coffee shop talking about the good old days. And for some reason, yesterday I thought of, now this may seem a little strange, but Stadler and Waldorf of the Muppets. <laughs> I had to YouTube them. I did grow up with the Muppets. Um, and just to get a good laugh. So laughter helps a lot when you're grieving. Um, we also did so much together, like helping at the church. And one winter, getting ready for Christmas, we were tearing down a wall that separated our sanctuary from another part of the church. And I can say there was some frustration on both our parts with that thing, that wall not wanting to come down. It was really built fairly strong. And I have to say the top of explosives came up a few times. <laughs> I said, I'm game, Phil, if you are. Uh, Phil was always there to help. He always had a great antidote to tell, a tool to lend, his truck and trailer at the ready, and it just goes on and on and on and on. I learned and saw Phil as a great and caring father, a devoted husband, and a gracious supportive friend to others he told me about and many he didn't tell me about. Uh, he would also be on the res ready to give me an encouraging word when I was struggling with something at work. It usually was a don't sweat it like comment that he was exceptionally versed at and very elegant and he had a knack for these. I really appreciated this and will miss it very much. Phil was ever so kind and warm-hearted, uh, gentle, patient, and inquisitive. We bonded over some common experiences and traits. I actually think we were both on the path of reformed cynics, embracing life and our families. One's men's retreat, we went on to, uh, we went to Villanueva State Park, and that day it poured rain like crazy. The kind of New Mexico rain you all know about that comes all in one day, like, uh, it was just Phil and I that went on a hike on this hill, or maybe small mountain, however you would look at it. We, get, we got soaked to the bone, and we kept going and talking about all kinds of things. And I remember now asking Phil, like, well, should we turn back? He's like, no, let's keep going. Okay, we kept going. Phil was not deterred in any of it, and I think that has, must have been how he always was, and, and I heard that today. It was true perseverance and downright gut and grit. I think Phil was in as good a place as I'd ever seen anyone. I truly know how much he loved his wife and his son, his mom, and I'm sure so many others that he didn't get a chance to tell me about. I'm missing my friend terribly and will for the rest of my life. I know we will get to see him again when our time comes but for now, I'm just trying to relish all the good times we had together. I'm grateful for God for bringing him into my life and showing me somebody with such a neat and beautiful soul. You know, when I finally got the gumption up to call my sister and tell her everything about my friend and what had happened, my sister said to me, hmm, perfected. That's, that's about all I could say about that. But I just want to thank you for letting me share a little bit with you today about my friend Phil and Jamie thank you for letting me come talk I really appreciate it. I just want to say God bless and keep all of you and thank you very much
my journey with Phil in this life began in 2009. I've often stopped and thought of what I was to Phil and what he was to me. I can tell you all what he was to me. He started out as a coworker. Soon he became a friend. Later a teacher, a mentor, and ultimately a brother. There's a lot of stories I could tell you about Phil. Many of them are with laughter. <laughs> What I want to impart to everyone here today are the lessons that Phil gave me. Not about anything genuinely technical, but about life. Within the first year of knowing Phil, I was bedeviled by things in my personal life as well as professionally. And when I was ready to take the next step, he approached me knowing that I had all these things that were just troubling me. And he said, take comfort in the words of Shakespeare. Come what, come may. Time and hour runs through the roughest day. What that means is Difficult times in your life will pass. And what he settled on was, as you go through these difficult times, never surrender your dignity. Walk through the difficult times with dignity. And always keep your head up. And as he stood there, of course, he looked down and said, if those words don't help you, Take comfort in the words of Snoop Dogg. <laughs> the key lesson that I walked away with, not necessarily that day, but as I grew with him, was keep your dignity about you. Later in life, when he was a mentor to me, I was sitting at his desk complaining about someone I was having, I was at odds with, and how wrong they were. And I realized that there was nothing but venomous words coming out of my mouth. And he stood up and he closed the door and I thought he was gonna join me and all of this and he looked at me and said, when you speak horribly about others, all you're doing is poisoning yourself. And he sat forward and he looked at me and said, just because someone doesn't like you should not be the reason that you don't like them. With those words, I realized there's all these people around me that if I just take a moment to learn from them, I can grow with them. The third lesson the third lesson I can share is a lesson that Phil's death taught me. Every time I had a technical question I couldn't answer or had been thinking about, I would email myself, ask Phil about this. And as I looked, I searched my emails for all of this, for all, everything that I told myself I should go ask Phil about. 
the day that he passed. All I could think about was how selfish I was. How I took him for granted. We all have people in our lives that we'll one day go ask questions about because we feel like they'll always be there. Phil shared his family with me. Anything that I could think of that a person can share, Phil shared with me. Phil shared his friends with me, and for that I will be forever be grateful. And hopefully, you all can take these lessons that I learned from him and realize that we still have each other to grow with and to learn from. Phil very much liked poetry, and he would write some of his own. And there's a poem that I read that characterizes Phil perfectly. The day I met him, he wasn't a perfect man, and the day he passed, he wasn't a perfect man, but but he passed having lived life to the fullest. By the Shawnee chief, Chief Tecumseh. So live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service to your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger, in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Thank you. to help me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to get through this. Uh, I, we'll see, but probably going to get through it one way or another. <laughs> All right. uh, Phil and I had the kind of love that isn't supposed to exist in real life. I first met him online when I was living in South Carolina, and every step of the way, from the economic treatises that he wrote me over email, to his startling kindness and understanding when we started texting, to his colorful account of trying to flood his entire undergraduate lab during our first phone conversation. At every step of the way, I expected the fantasy, this perfect, brilliant, hilarious, noble, compassionate man to wear off. 35,000 miles of plane and road trips later, Phil got down on one knee in my tiny apartment. And six months after that, we were married beneath a sudden burst of sunlight through the clouds, and it never wore off. 
Instead, the impossible happened. You can come up. Here, I can hold him. Are you want help? Hey! I'm gonna help your mommy. Is this help? Gonna help? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe help. Maybe. Um, instead, the impossible happened. Every day, every month, every obstacle we laughed about, every lazy Sunday, every goodnight kiss, every time we took care of each other in big ways and small, it got deeper, it got better, it got more impossibly beautiful. I got pregnant, and after Phil was making, done making copious amounts of fun of his beached whale wife, I gave birth to a son. Phil cried as he took him into his arms, and then proceeded to be as astounding a father as he was a husband. Everything Killian did was fantastic to Phil, and Phil was Killian's sleep dad, the snuggliest person there was, the highest tosser, the best beard and lower lip to pull on and trigger a spell of tickle wrestling. Killian liked nothing more than throwing tools around the floor of his daddy's office as Phil read articles on geopolitics while simultaneously listening to YouTubes on engineering disasters and World War II tanks. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they'd come in and they'd have set aside their individual pursuits to watch a bird documentary together. Anyone who spent any time with our family will tell you, when I'm out of earshot, that Killian far preferred Phil to me. <laughs> I'm not gonna pretend I didn't sometimes gripe to Phil about this, given that I birthed and nursed the little guy. <laughs> but I'm sure glad they had that now. And I'm so glad he knew he had a little girl on the way who was already kicking exquisitely the moment he got home from work. There are so many stories about how Phil was with us, but I'll share two recent ones that come to mind. The first is the last party we went to. Yeah, that's your daddy. Uh, we went to with a bunch of people from Lanel, some of whom are here today. I barely knew anyone, Had Killian was the only kid there, but my wonderfully extroverted husband introduced us around and then proceeded to be his usual hilarious, straightforward, informative self. He was clearly having a fantastic time, just getting into the groove, when he noticed that Killian and I were tired and slowly starting to decompensate. Immediately, he said his goodbyes and walked us to the door. As he ushered his pregnant, introverted wife and crazed toddler to the car, I apologize that we put, put a damper on his big evening. Any party is way more fun with you two there, he told me simply. A week or two later, Phil was planning on going target shooting up on the Mesa as we often did together. Uh, uh, yeah, that's you and your daddy and your mommy. Uh, I was tired and told him I might sit this one out, stay home and catch up on laundry or something. He nodded and spent 45 minutes packing his huge green truck with an indescribable array of shooting gear. And then I felt his arm around my waist. Hun, I understand if you're too tired, but I'd love to have you guys with me. It was our last trip to the Mesa as a little family. Yeah, that's us. Phil once told me, Phil once told me that before we met, he thought joy was an experience, not a state of being. No. And it's true. Every single day we spent together, no matter how many grumbles about fiscal policy, or how many trips to the vet, or crying babies, her cardboard boxes of weird tools collecting on our coffee table, every single day together was a joy. <laughs> and that joy and that love are something that will sustain me for the rest of my life, something that could never, ever die. Thank you. I remember, um, so I'm the worship leader at the church that Phil attended and Jamie and the family. And I just remember when, when Phil and you, Jamie, Killian wasn't even born yet. But the first day you guys entered into that church building, I just saw that joy in Phil's face. 
holding your hand. I remember he was holding your hand, walking into the building of the church. And I just, I, I can still see it to now, his joy. He had so much joy. You are the love of his life. And I remember Phil, <laughs> while worshiping, I could see him. He was a true worshiper, right? He would sing in the, in the back of the room. <laughs> he truly was. And that was such a blessing to see his heart. So I believe this is one of his favorite songs, right? Called The Good, Good Father, because he is a good father.
This picture on the inside of your bulletin is a picture of Phil reading to Killian. It's the last picture that Jamie ever took of Phil. And he was reading this book, I See You, by Eric Carle. Yeah, you can have the book if you want, buddy. And that book reads in part, I see you in the butterfly who flutters so high. I see you in the clouds that float across the sky. I see you in the puppy who loves to play and chew. I see you in the glowing silver moon, too. I see you in the bird who's learning to take flight. I see you in the stars that bring blink so very bright. Please join me in prayer and this benediction, this blessing for all of us here. Source of love and light, may we who loved and respected Phil carry him in our hearts all of our days. May we ourselves be reflections of his best qualities May we be honorable, honest, generous, and trustworthy. May we elevate others and let these traits shine forth from each of us as we rise again from our grief and our loss. May we who loved Phil reflect these qualities so that his children through us can know a bit more about their dad. May we have the courage to look our hardest times in the face with resiliency and humor. Go now in peace. Go with wonder and curiosity. Go in love and live as light to the world that surrounds us. Amen.